Hey, ¿qué amo? Hey, hello. Hi, hi. So welcome to come back to uh, Guillermo and the conversation. Uh, this is a series of uh, uh, Guillermo's journey, and uh, uh, so Guillermo is from Argentina, uh, now living in Slovenia. He's an artist and teacher, um, a very unique person. So last time we were talking about your trip, your first trip to the uh, Western France uh, with the one uh, not we have maintained a bicycle. Um, so <laughs> do you want to uh, tell us the story? Like when when it, it uh, was the trip and uh, what happened uh, during the trip? Yes, um, I traveled there to France with uh, my girlfriend at that point, And we were, uh, we went to get, uh, to meet her twin sister. That's what, that was actually the, the meeting of her with her sister was the, the origin of the trip itself. And she brought me because we were in love and we were together and then she just invited me to this adventure. You know? um, we went to Paris, then from Paris we went to Nantes. Nantes is already in, in Brittany, in, in, in the west, um, northwest of France. Uh, it, it used to be called Finisterre. Uh, Finisterre is probably some kind of Latin, and it's the end of the land, no? Finis is f finality, and uh, Terre it was like territorial, it's about the end of the earth. No? Um, so they had, uh, th she was there doing some kind of university or something, this sister of her. Mm -hmm. That's why we went there, actually. And once we went there, they were uh, these two girls, th those two uh, sisters who one was a video maker, was my girlfriend, and the other girl was a photographer. And they had a long story about how to finance their artistic projects and they knew, they had a little bit of a skill into finding ideas about that, how mm -hmm. to finance things. And they came up with this idea, I don't know if before we came there or after we were there, I don't know exactly how. They brainstormed probably and then they decided to make interviews of uh, neo, -druid, neo -druid, druids. Um, it's a movement that it's in, in this area of France, and I think also in the south of, right in front across the water in England, there is also like vestiges of the same type of culture, which are supposed to be the remains of like an ancient Celtic wisdom or something like that. Um, so they, created this idea where they will go and interview these druids, my girlfriend would do a film, and her sister would take photos, and they will sell the interview to some magazine or something like that. That was the whole plan. Oh. Um, and the idea was to do it on bikes. I actually don't know why, but they decided to do it by, uh, instead of moving through buses or something, by bikes. So I was kind of like invited with not much other options into this trip. I probably say yes because I was into saying yes to whatever adventure it comes to me, but I had zero idea of how hard it is actually to bike so many hours per day. And well, all the all the other extra elements that I was mentioning about the cultural shock of being in this culture. And the thing is, like uh, they have the super tip top bikes. I don't know exactly how it was. I think the sister has her own bike. That was she was preparing maybe for something like that for a long time. Then she kind of got a very good bike for her sister. But because I was the new element that probably wasn't in the plan, they kind of bought a, a bike for 50 euros somewhere and they, they gave me that. You know. I don't know how was the price, but now comparing from the life I have today, I would say something like that. And then it was like, uh, it was really absurd, the situation. But I don't know, it, it took some time to become like that, but. Uh, so one of the first ideas was to uh, actually go to a, like a bike repair shop in some kind of university where the guy had all these uh, tools and mm. he helped you to repair your own bike. That was a project they had. And he was talking to me in French and I got no I idea. nothing. You know? and, and he kept explaining because obviously he didn't know other language. And 
And then he was showing me technically with his hands how to open some part or how to put a brake or like basics of the repetition of like, but everything he was saying it in French and I couldn't recognize any word. You know? Because you look like someone who knows French. <laughs> I don't know why it was. I mean, apparently one of the things that happened to French people is that they, they simply don't know any other language. You know? or, or maybe they don't even, if they know a little bit, they they don't want to go to a travel office. It's hard to know because I, I, I don't know. Um, well, this was the, one of the first intense stories I remember. Then it was also like in this city in Nantes, we arrived to the house with, with the, where the sister of my girlfriend was living. Mm -hmm. And the day of my birthday, which was like after four or five days of being in France, mm -hmm. was a guy that has the birthday on the same day, <laughs> one of the roommates. So, he organized a super party for his friends and there was a cake and drinks and a party. And I was shocked to see that for my person in a context where nobody even knew when it was, I ended up having a party, even if it was not dedicated to me. <laughs> it was really absurd. And then there were other elements, like for example, I didn't have any money or any equipment to, to tow the bike. So I got, uh, they had this, uh, waterproof, like very mm. sophisticated things. And I have some bags, uh, trash bags, you know, <laughs> these black ones, you know, just to put here. And then I had one for here and one for down. And there was some photos of that, that I don't know, I probably disappeared already. And everything was like that. They have a very destroyed bike, a very bad backpack probably, and then uh, uh, a trash bin bag for uh, waterproof. And then we went out, you know. And this was like really hours and hours and hours and hours of biking uh, in lines, you know, really, really epic. And after uh, the travels, I really appreciate the, my experience of Britannia. It's so intense, you know, the, all the landscape. And, and every time you, after hours of biking, you sit somewhere and you eat something hot or you drink a coffee. It's like the most amazing thing that ever happened to you. you know? and, and this level of intensity really gets recorded deeply in the in the emotional body or in the it's like it gets recorded with an intensity that that easily overrides other type of intensities but at least in my case no it was something that i remember like i don't know how related it is but i kind of have a memory of reading that socrates always preferred to walk and talk you know it was an idea that by, the, by moving the body at the same time that thinking and, and evolving these ideas, the, the benefit of, of this intellectual philosophical process would be also uh, printed in the body at, a, at some kind of level, you know. And so really, really intense experience. And the idea was the first person we met, it was some kind of friend or like a known person for an aunt of these girls. We went to the farm, they live in the countryside, and then she gave us the address of this person that she knew. Maybe she was doing some workshop with him or something, you know. Uh, then we went to talk with this guy and he was extremely, extremely interesting. And um, with his big mustache and this beard like this, you know, and then short hair, but really, really French looking and really, really like a druid looking type of person. <laughs> and some kind of super philosophy, you know, but in the countryside, you know. He was doing all kind of stuff, like he was like using like incantation with the voice to charge the, the wine, you know, before giving us wine. He says, okay, I have this pendulum and he was tested. He has some kind of very primitive device that that mark the quality of uh, something, I don't know, the energetic quality of something, but really, really like made with wood or something. And then he will put his pendulum on this wine and then put it in this small device and check how high in the in the mark uh, the energy of the wine was you know? and he didn't question the idea of the pendulum at all you know like it was just this was the way to measure it you know? and then uh, then he goes out with the wine you know open the door face the i don't know the north or the south or something and then he says something in Gaelic, you know? to the wine you know some kind of pray in the in, wow. in, in this uh, breton language or something Mm. And, and he comes in again with the, with the bottle and he measured it with the same device. <laughs> and he proved to us that now the, the energy of the wine was high superior. You know? 
<laughs> and now is good time to open it. You know, and now we can drink. Yeah. Now we can drink. You know? And then, but well, independently of the of the the superstitious side of the situation, you know, where you can, I don't know, what is the, the scientific theory behind a, a pendulum? It's like you subconsciously moving wherever you want. Basically, I think this is the idea. But for the people who use it, um, it really, it it is really something that they it surprised them you know in a way they, they don't know or they don't believe that they move it subconsciously they just obey that they just interpret the location of the pendulum wherever it chooses to go you know? so it could be both things i don't know I, I, I don't know i just find it so funny and many of the things because they were talking like this for three hours maybe and they these two girls were asking questions to him and i could barely sense what they were talking about because it's Latin language and several things I could grasp, you know. Oh, now they're talking about, I don't know what, you know, humanity or nature or some mystery of some kind. Of. And then, but I couldn't really understand nothing at all in terms of uh, absorbing this knowledge, you know. So I was, I was really only in the, in the emotional perception you know i could feel the emotions i could feel a lot of things and i could kind of absorb the quality of the situation without being able to intellectualize it you know? and this was really 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 intense i don't know if the intense thing was the 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 biking or the weather or bretagne in itself or the people we met the quality of their, their how developed they were or or the fact that i didn't understand nothing but all together was really intense and then every through it would give us the address of the next one. <laughs> so, so, we'll so you don't know what the, the deal. what that what is the uh, next you will go. You don't know, yeah. No, no, we didn't have a plan to visit. They didn't know nothing. Uh, we just, uh, we, I think they invented this idea. Oh, we will ask the, the first one. We ask for the next, you know, mm. because they all know. I mean, they knew each other, and then. So this was a really nice idea, actually. I think to 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 design the trip in this way. And then he sent us to another guy that the guy that he recommended to us, you know. He probably knew many other druids, but he recommended mm -hmm. us based on experience that we should go and visit this one in this village, you know. I mean it also had to be close, you know, because it had to be, I think, around maximum probably around I think that we never made more than hundred kilometers to get to another druid, you know. Probably was between thirty and forty, sixty kilometers biking sometimes. It was usually more than one day to get there, uh, but sometimes it was maybe we left in the morning and we arrived in the evening or something like that. Um, so we went like this from Druid to Druid, you know, like getting like moving through this incredible landscape of Bretagne, searching for these little, um, for these uh, towns and really absorbing all the all the landscape, you know. And then I remember in some moments, like, uh, because many times we, we couldn't find the place on time, it was dark, or we were lost, or we were tired, and we wanted to eat, and it, all, it was all happening at a very, very, very low budget, you know, because I didn't have, my money disappeared after five days, and they, they were not into, like, maintaining me or something, you know, because, I don't know, they didn't like it, maybe they didn't have money, or it was never like that, you know. So I started to draw. I was drawing these druids. Uh, I think it was the only way to do something about it. And then I was trying to participate in their project in the way like, okay, we photograph them, draw them in life, and make videos about the druids, and then we will try to sell all that. You know? And then, um, well, it went. It went all right. in one of these uh, problems, uh, was, uh, my bike was making a lot of problems, you know, and I had no tools. And no way to actually fix it in any way because uh, even if I would have the tools, I wouldn't know how to. You know, so they, I don't know how we solve this problem. I, I just remember one day getting completely angry and grabbing this bike and hitting it on the on the on the road, you know, because it was just breaking all the time or something like. Really, moments of losing uh, con total control of the situation in a way, um, and, and there was another time. Because, as I described the last time, there was a lot of difficulties when you don't understand nothing, when you don't have money, when you don't know nothing, and everything yeah. is yelling to you from being so different, you know. 
And one day I went under a table. <laughs> we were kind of rescued by one guy randomly and he offered us a place to sleep and something to eat. And in the, in the next morning, we were preparing to go out and I went under a table in the garden and I couldn't go out of the table. <laughs> the, it was so over, I, I wanted to say this in the last period, in the last chapter, but that, I ran out of time. It was so shocking, you know, that it was so much that I, I just went under the table and I didn't want to, wanted to go out. And my girlfriend talked to me like uh, around half an hour to slowly calm me down and put me out from, from underneath a table in the garden <laughs> in France, you know, with 35, 30 something years, you know. I was like, it was so absurd. But, the, but this is what I wanted to say last time that uh, the level of, the level of weakness that you experience when, when the main elements that we use to, to move our life are, are not available, you know. It's really, really shocking. Well, we, might, we went through to Druids and Druids and just, I, I'm trying to, to speed up to, to cover. In the end, we visit nine Druids. I don't remember now all of them, but I probably could if I sit with more time. I, may, I have drawings of them. The drawings were lost, but I have the photos of them, of the drawings. And at some point we met one Druid who told us a story a story of um, there was a <clears throat> there is a, a knight with a black horse who is in the forest uh, in this like medieval times maybe and he see a very beautiful girl in a white horse and then he goes towards her and she runs away from him so because he was so brave and pride and his horse was so high quality he chased her and he chased her and chased her and chased her and chased her and chased him forever, you know, uh, uh, for a long time. And the more he ran after her, the farthest she gets. And this druid was telling us that for him, druidism and all the all this philosophy was somehow an expression. It was expressed in this um, in this story because the the lady, um, the the man in the black horse is the self, and the lady is the knowledge. And the more you, you, you feel attracted by the knowledge and you go after her. And the more you go after her, the farther it gets. And he was somehow referring to the intellectual knowledge. No, 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 no to the intellectual pursuit of knowledge. So, and uh, we went in a ceremony with this person. He was like a, some kind of high rank or something. With, so we, we participated in a ceremony with him as well in the forest, and it was really, really strong to see, to hear this all very ancient language and these incantations and circles with stone, like a tree full of, of, of red uh, color uh, fabric attached to the leaves. A lot of beauty, a lot of beauty, or, or like very primitive ancient beauty made today or something. The guys, they have these tunics, white tunics that they use for the ceremonies and probably one has this stick or something like, it was like a little bit of a, like a caricature, but because they were so deeply into that and they were all, they were all men and they were all uh, a bit aged, you know, around 50 or more or a lot more, then they, they had, there was an imposing feeling on them, you know. Even if they look a bit like a caricature of something, you know? but uh, so it was really nice, and I draw these things and experience them. Mm. Then we went to another druid that actually was uh, around 90 years old, and we visited him in his apartment, and he had a dog that was like a mountain, you know, like uh, who was all the time growling to us too, during the whole event. Um, then we went, we end up, and the last druid. Uh, then we met some, some two druids that were connect, very well connected. One had a library, like a bookshop, all in Breton, Breton language. He had hundreds of books of all like kind of qualities uh, in his own library in the city. And he was almost much more like, a, like an activist uh, to support the, the speaking of the language Breton in France that at some point was forbidden or something. 
and he sent us, uh, and he was doing some strange practice. I, I could sense because I was in such a state of perception. He was talking to us, and at the same time, he was doing something else, something within himself, you know. And we, I could perceive it, you know, because I couldn't follow the question, so I could see that he was actually interacting and doing some kind of practice inside. And I, I asked my girlfriend to translate the question, and he said, "Yes, I am. I am actually talking to you, and at the same time, I am doing one of my uh, own, our practices." You know? Then we met the great druid of Bretagne. I was that we expect it will be the most, uh, the top of the Fancy. people in Britannia. <laughs> yes. It was the highest rank, uh, mm -hmm. which, uh, and he called us to a, a Irish pub to drink beer, and he showed up with a suit and a cr cravat, you know, and with the hair like this, like a businessman, you know, like a politician. And he has the most, he was such a character. All these were like movie characters, you know? Really, really charismatic and super developed and super unique. No, if, if you want to talk about uniqueness, um, and he was telling more that he was more like a syndicalist for the rights of Breton people in Britannia. Basically, that all his work was, he he had to go to some ceremonies in the specific times of the year, but his his thing was not. Uh, he was not even religious, and he was more about supporting the community of of, of Breton people in France. And working, I don't know, for for the rights and for the I don't know the science industry that we have translation and all these type of things, you know. Like a mayor. <laughs> like yeah, in a way, like as let's say something like let's say like yeah, not the mayor like officially recognized by the government, but like the representative of of, of the mm -hmm. nation, yeah, in this level and dedicated to those things. And then we end up with end up talking with the, one of the few uh, women through it because apparently it's a very male-oriented uh, tradition. And this woman was like a, a famous harp musician mm. who was one of the very, very, very few women who was allowed in, in, in Druidism, maybe because her, her master was a bit more open-minded or something. We also have this conversation with her, and this was the first time I went to some circles of stones that she brought us there to show us these ancient uh, things. And they were talking because I couldn't understand nothing. I went to play in the stones, let's say. No? And then I started to walk and I, there, and I started to feel these subtle energies. Mm, that, so that much. Yeah. Very, I, I, I could really perceive like a kind of currents, like it would be like currents of water, but in like, it would be like winds or something. But it was not physical. It was more like a tendency of my body to go towards one side or another or to move faster or slower. Something that, as a dancer, you 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 somehow develop in some cases if if you have this capacity to perceive these subtle things. And then I asked her if if this was possible or not, you know. And she said yes, yes. These are all these places that we where we do the ceremonies that they have these monoliths and these incredibly big stones placed there. I you don't know even how they do it. They are all energetically very strong. And this is why they choose to do those things. Um, and she told us that actually one of her ways of practicing Druidism was always relate to the to the elements, you know. So when she was drinking tea, for example, or washing the dishes, she was connecting spiritually with the spirit of water, let's say, or with the element of water. And that was her practice, her, her way of work. And then when she was doing the garden, she would connect with the earth or walking and then or when she was singing, she was connecting with the wind. And basically how, she was how saying does, that, how does she uh, sorry, how does she connect? Like she she did it by by the um, uh, how do you say the the imagination or yeah, she, probably, just, something like that. Yeah, she would okay. she would like have some kind of inner type of prayer. Okay. Say. She, I don't remember exactly how she said uh, so it's something that we touch in many uh, many conversations with you. The idea of the essential, no? There is an essential. There is something that is a manifestation of things, and there is mm -hmm. the, the essential and its manifestations, no? So in the, the essential would be the water, and the manifestation is the the, the, the tea, washing the, the dishes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. She was always going back to this essential nature of things, which apparently. For them, it's only these four elements, you know, water, earth, fire, and wind. Wind, yes. And he, 
she would kind of remember or, or orient her consciousness to the origin, the essential origin of the thing that she was dealing with. You know, now I'm talking to you, thinking about all these memories, but she would probably try to connect uh, mentally with the idea of the wind, you know, or the energy of the wind or the spirit, because I'm using it for, for talking, you know. That's right. And that was somehow the way that they, one of the things that these mysterious druidic, druidic practices could be something like that, you know. Mm. Then we met another guy in some kind of very, very, almost creepy, but very, very respect imposing a small castle or something. And he had like a most unbelievable type of architecture house with, with some, it was like a house that was in the center has like an open. And then there were several floors, I think like three or four floors up with uh, vitro, with this stained glass windows. It was almost like a some very strange church, his place, you know? And this was his house. And in every level he had some kind of something. And in the top level, he has his uh, artistic workshop. He was some kind of painter. Very, very, very mysterious looking guy. Very old and dressed with a super tight suit. Uh, he was really like a picture of nowhere, I don't know, very mysterious, guttural voice, very collected and very like, uh, every, all his gestures were really controlled and he was really, really serious and, 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 and controlling every single words he was saying and observing every single thing we were doing. And he, I don't remember very well what he talked about, but uh, I remember I drove him and he was pleased by his, me drawing him. And then they were all pleased with me in a way. They all, at some point, they all made some nice gestures toward me at some point that I could feel like a true caring or true love, in, even without knowing me. Ah, this was a case, yeah. Um, and then the last druid we visit, the number nine. Uh, How many? You, you was, visit nine, yeah? We visit nine druids in three months. In two months and a half, or something like that. And or maybe two months, let's say. And then he was actually, he has been expelled from the Druid communities because he revealed some secrets, you know. He was like much more like a kind of rock star type of character, uh, very talkative and able and much because more he, informal. He talked too much, yes. Extremely <laughs> informal, yeah, yeah, yeah. And very completely open minded, you know, instead of following these right principles. And he was more like an open-minded philosopher that was at some point in Druidism and then they kicked him out and he went on with his research, you know. So he was not afraid or he was not uh, sorrow about being kicked out. He saw that was a proof that actually they were like close-minded and that they, it's not what he thought it was or what they even say it's, it is. It. And then he told us that the story when we, I don't know, in through this conversation, we refer to the story of this uh, horse and the lady so, the horse. Uh, oh, this is a story he told you, yeah? The, we mentioned that the, the, a previous druid told us this story. And he okay. said, ah, but this is not the end of the story. You see, they don't understand nothing. <laughs> okay, okay, wait, wait, wait. wait <laughs> let's, let's talk about the end of the story in next The end episode. of the druidic story coming That's, next chapter. <laughs> next chapter, yes. <laughs> This is very important. <laughs> okay. So good, so good. The title will be The End uh, of the, I don't know, uh, Horse Story? Horse. Chasing the Girl on the Horse. Chase, chasing the, the chasing. <laughs> the, the Girl on the White Horse. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> That's wonderful. There's a, this is a main <laughs> story. I mean, it's like a movie where, like, uh, you are talking I about. I really push it to, to. I knew that I had so much thing to say. I need to say it so fast before it runs no, no, out of time. You can always have, have, have more to say. Uh, we must stop somewhere. Of course, of course, of course. I, I have to get used to pack the stories. Yes. But yes. so many memories come to me. It's unbelievable. Yes. So yes. much to say. Yeah. yeah, but this is wonderful. This, this is so interesting. Okay, so let's share with uh, everybody next time what happened to the chasing of the girl on the white horse, okay? 
And uh, thank you, Guillermo. And uh, we'll talk next time. Yes. See you. See you. <laughs> Thank you.